Hi, everybody. How is it going today? I'm glad to see all of you here. Uh, oh, Brent Lee. Hi, how you doing, Brent? Johnny, how's it going? Kev? Christian, good to see you. Yes, Mia Reading Corner. Glad to see you here. Well, I'm so happy that uh, people uh, have come out to uh, find out about some of the latest discoveries. Um, and uh, I, I assume a lot of you are off now. You're having a, a nice weekend with your families, perhaps, or uh, just kicking back. Maybe some of you have to work, but I think if you're here, you're probably not at work. Well, maybe you are at work. I don't know. Um, but good morning to you all. Hey there, Courier 6. Hi, Fritz. Uh, Stefano, uh, how's it going? Kennifer, good to see you. Good morning. Uh, some of you might be in the afternoon. I was actually considering maybe um, in 2024 moving these to 2 p.m. Eastern just so that people in Australia can join in, uh, but that might uh, throw things off for other people. I'm not sure, but you, we may do it at a different time next month. We'll see. Uh, for those of you who maybe haven't heard, I am now offering courses, ancient history courses, and um, I'm excited about that. I've got two on the schedule. Uh, if you go to the link that uh, I have in the description box below this video, you can see the two courses. They are Ancient Explorers, which is a course about, yes, just what it says, exploration in the ancient world. In the uh, Now, this is long before the age of discovery that we all think of, uh, but who does a course on this? Not, no one that I know of. So I thought it would be great to offer it to you. And then I have another course, which I actually, actually haven't officially announced, but it's called The Dawn of Civilization, which is all about how civilization developed in the uh, ancient Near East. So I think um, both of those are um, things that you might like. So go check them out at the link that I left below the video. Um, and those of you who have already signed up, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Uh, it starts, uh, the first one starts January 7th. Yeah. Anyway, so, uh, oh, one other announcement. This is the, you, you people are the first that are going to hear this. This is just a personal thing, but um, I'm getting married. Yeah. I'm getting married uh, in March. So it's coming up quick. And uh, it's no one that you know. It's no one that you've seen on any of the videos, okay? Uh, but I will reveal more information about it later. But for now, I just wanted to let you know that uh, nuptials are forthcoming. So I'm looking forward to that, and that's exciting too. Um, anyway, thank you for the congratulations, everybody. Uh, so without further ado, let's talk about the latest archaeological discoveries from the month of December, okay? And by the way, um, tomorrow, I think, or the next day, the next day or two, I'm going to put out uh, my yearly greatest discoveries, archaeological discoveries of the year. Uh, so you'll get those. So th that'll be all the best ones I picked out, the 20 best archaeological discoveries for the whole year. So that'll come out tomorrow, I think. And uh, But today we're just going to talk about uh, interesting discoveries from the last month or so. Um, so let's talk about them. So the first one I want to tell you about, let me, uh, switch over to this screen here. The ruins of a temple dedicated to goddess Kubaba. You might not have even heard of Kubaba before, <laughs> but this is in, uh, Turkey. Uh, it's in the South. Uh, this is a city that was a Hittite city. Uh, but before the Hittites, uh, it was inhabited by people we know as the Luwians. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Luwians. Um, but they were the ones who worshipped the goddess Kubaba. So yeah, ruins of a temple belonging to the goddess Kubaba were found in the ancient city of Kastabala. Uh, so this is uh, down in Osmania province. Uh, anyway, uh, you can see some of the images here from the ruins of the temple. Uh, the temple was it's, uh, built by the Luwians, who are considered the oldest indigenous people of Anatolia. Uh, are they? Well, yeah, they're one of, yeah, I suppose. They're not the only ones that were in Anatolia, but yeah, they were around a long time. And in fact, the Luwian language is, is the basis of what we uh, think of as the Hittite language. Um, yes, 
Uh, I'm sorry, no, Hittite language is Indo-European. Uh, Luwians? No, yeah, the Luwians are, are Indo-Europeans as well, as I recall. Yeah. Um, during the colonnaded street excavations, a building ruin, a temple that we date to the Archaic period, that is 540 BC, was unearthed. In Aramaic inscriptions located in the hinterland of Kastabala, the lands of Kastabla and Kubaba are mentioned. This building ruin we unearth must be a temple belonging to the goddess Kubaba. Now, as you see from the date here, this is rather late. Uh, the Luwians were in Anatolia a long time before that, but this is the remains of a temple, that probably a newer temple that's built upon an older one. Okay, The priests of this temple walked on hot coals with bare feet without feeling any pain. Yeah. Uh, so this is kind of cool. Oh, you can see a little bit more here. You, you can definitely see some Greek influence, and that's because we're looking at the 6th century uh, BC here. But keep in mind that this was here. They were here a long time before this. Okay, we don't know a lot about Kubaba, so hopefully we'll find maybe some documents about here in the temple. But I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, after each one, I'm just gonna take a quick look at your comments just to make sure uh, you don't have any questions or anything. But um, uh, yes, Luwian is Anatolian language family. Uh, I believe it's an Indo. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a, the Anatolian subfamily of the Indo-European languages. Um, Kennifer, if it wasn't for this channel and a heated debate with Dr. Miano, I'd st still, uh, I'd still we be wheel, wheel event. No, I don't understand the English there, <laughs> but I assume uh, it means that you were once a believer in Atlantis. So uh, uh, I'm glad I had some effect, Kennifer. Yes, I believe. Uh, yes. Good, good. Uh, I've actually, I, now and then I get comments from people that I change their mind, which is like the greatest thing to hear uh, from people. Like, I, I actually feel like uh, the information I provided has helped. Um, so I'm glad about that. Uh, all right, let's take a look at another one. So this one is, uh, it's translated here from Italian, uh, but it's from Italy. Colosseum, new domus discovered between the Roman Forum and the Palatine Hill. Uh, so uh, a domus, of course, is a domicile. Uh, the Colosseum, this is in, in the Colosseum Archaeological Park. So this is the area that everybody goes to anyway, and you'd think, oh, we found everything, there, right? Everything we found. It, I mean, come on, they've been, that's been open for a long time. We know every, no, there's still new things sometimes found there. So there was a, there's a new research project that's been going on there, and it has brought to light some rooms of a luxurious domus from the late Republican age of which some wall structures had been excavated in 2018 and which once existed exactly in the area in which in the Augustan age, that's in the reign of the Emperor Augustus, uh, the first emperor, the Horea Agrippiana were, uh, were built, the famous warehouses along the Vicus Tuscus, that's a road, okay, built by uh, Agrippa. Yeah, between the Horea family, between the warehouses and the slopes of the Palatine Hill, the domus is spread over several floors, probably divided into terraces and characterized by at least three building phases dating back to the second half of the second century BC at, and the end of the first century BC. This, distributed around an, an atrium garden, the domus presents as its main environment the uh, Spicus Aestivus, a banquet room that uh, imitates a cave. Oh, it's, I think it's Aestivus. Uh, used during the summer season and originally animated by spectacular water features. Uh, but I want to show you this video here. Um, Italian, but it shows you some of the uh, remains that they found. Look at the color still on there. Isn't that beautiful? All the links to these, I will leave them in the video after I'm done with the live stream, and you can go check them out. But that just gives you a little bit of a taste of what they found there. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Any uh, any comments or questions on that one? Agrippa of Augustus's generation. Yes, that Agrippa. Um, I think it's a fictional place based. Are oh, you talking about Atlantis, Kennifer? I think it's a fictional place based off of something real. Most likely the Minoan Santorini before the eruption. Yeah, that that could very well be. Wow, the color is still so distinctive. Yes, it's a it's so fantastic when uh, you still get the color uh, on some of these places. So, 
Um, I thought that was interesting. Okay, let's take a look at another one. Uh, all right, now this is um, not an actual archaeological discovery. I mean, it was, okay, in the past, but it's actually an analysis of an archaeological discovery. Some of the things I share are what we might call historical discoveries or scientific discoveries based on archaeological discoveries, and that's what this is. All right, so DNA sleuths solve mystery of the 2,000-year-old corpse. Now, what is this? Here's the corpse, all right? How did a young man born 2,000 years ago near what is now southern Russia end up in the English countryside? Yeah, so they found this guy. He is a Sarmatian, okay, an ancient people. And the Sarmatians, I think there's a map down here. Yeah, the Sarmatians lived here in this area around the Black Sea, north north, north, uh, east of the Black Sea. Here's the Roman Empire. And here is where this guy's body was found, right, at Alfred Cluny, right? Why was he way over here? Well, the genetic evidence has given us some clues, okay? Research shows the skeleton found in Cambridgeshire is of a man from a nomadic group known as Sarmatians. It's the first biological proof that these people came to Britain from the furthest reaches of the Roman Empire and that some lived in the countryside. Um, anyway, let's talk about the, the science here. Uh, they discovered a, a complete well-preserved skeleton of a man. A man, they named him Offord Clooney 203645. Okay. Uh, Dr. Marina Silva of the Ancient Genomics Laboratory at Francis Crick Institute in London extracted the DNA. She says, it's not like testing of DNA of someone who is alive. The DNA is very fragmented and damaged. However, we were able to decode enough of it. The first thing we saw was that genetically, he was very different to the other Romano-British individuals studied so far. So he didn't fit in with the other people that have been DNA tested uh, from ancient times in uh, Roman Britain. The latest Ancient DNA analysis methods are now able to flesh out the human stories behind events that until recently have been reconstructed only by documents and archaeological evidence. Okay, so what do we find out about him? All right. Uh, we know he's buried in a ditch between 126 and 228 AD. Okay, this is when the Romans held Britain. At first, they thought him to be an unremarkable discovery, but the DNA showed that he was, of course, Sarmatian from uh, southern Russia, Armenia, and Ukraine. So the question was, why or how did he get all the way over here? What was he doing here? Okay. Um, so a team from the archaeology department of Durham University used an exciting analysis technique to examine his fossilized teeth, which have chemical traces of what he ate. And what did they found? They found that until the age of six, he ate millets and sorghum grains, and we know that's where Sar they had that in Sarmatia, okay? But over time, analysis showed a gradual decrease in his consumption of these grains and more wheat, which was found in Western Europe, okay? So they were trying to figure out, did this guy, was he a descendant of Sarmatians that migrated to Britain, or did he migrate to Britain himself. And they found out that it was him. He actually personally migrated to Britain because he had evidence of eating food from Sarmatia and then gradually switching to what was in Europe. So they were able to fig fig figure that out. Think about the, the, what they can do now, right? You're, they're just taking traces from people's teeth now, their food, and they're able to figure out a little bit about uh, when they were eating what, and then they'll know uh, their movements. So this is really cool. Yeah. Offord could have been a cavalryman's son or possibly his slave. Uh, around the time he lived, a unit of the Sarmatian cavalry in, incorporated into the Roman army was posted to Britain. So there could be a connection there. Yeah. So anyway, pretty interesting discovery. Um. Please post this video for later. I will, Larry. Uh, this will be up later. So if you miss anything, you can watch it. Okay. Um, so crazy that he, he, we can they can understand all that. Yes, that's true. 
this is super ironic. The storyline of King Arthur was Sarmatian knights working under a Roman Arthur, Artorius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be interesting if there was a connection. Do you have a suggestion for other high-quality YouTube channels with stuff about ancient history? Uh, I can't do that right now, but I do. Um, uh, but I'll have to prepare a list. Maybe I'll put it up somewhere, like good other channels you can watch. I actually have recommended channels, I think, on my channel, which tells you some other cool channels. But I do have to update that. Uh, good stuff. Amazing. Big fan from Iran. Oh, nice to see you, Sohel. Uh, I hope they're able to visit Iran one day. I do would I would love to visit Iran one day. There's all kinds of great Persian artifacts there. Uh, that's the plot from a movie, not anything from Arthuriana mythology. Oh, oh. Isotopic analysis is amazing. Yes, yes. Okay, let's take a look at another one, all right? Human and animal skin identified by paleoproteom... <laughs> Proteomics? Is it paleoproteomics? Is that how you say it? In Scythian leather objects from Ukraine. Now, you might say, oh, this is a boring scientific study. Well, it's not boring because this scientific study has analyzed leather. This is from the Scythians. Maybe you've heard of the Scythians, okay? It's analyzed their leather, and it has found. Well, I'll, take, I'll show you uh, down here. Well, here's some of the leather uh, right here. Okay, some of the fragments. Okay, but I want to show you uh, this. Okay, so this tells you what animals the leather came from. Okay, so you can see some uh, some animals. These are some of these are extinct animals, uh, but they were in the area at one time. But notice over here, four percent humans. Yeah, they made leather not only out from animals, but also from human skin, which is interesting because we have some writings of Herodotus, the Greek historian who tells us about Scythians, and he mentions that uh, things about them, I'm not sure if he specifically mentions the skin, but he does mention them drinking uh, out of human skulls and things like that, okay? So there's a reputation already for the Scythians to be like this, and this Scientific analysis has confirmed that actually, yeah, they're using parts of humans <laughs> to make things, all right? So kind of gruesome, but uh, very interesting study. So I'll leave a link to this too, and you can check out and get more information about it. Now, it's all about the animals too, but uh, it is interesting that there is human skin uh, as part of this. Hmm? Uh Face orange biting nails. <laughs> wow. Scythians were in the southern uh, Balkans. Um, well, I don't think Ukraine is considered Balkans, is it? Um, did they get as far as the southern Balkans? I They uh, they didn't stay there, I don't think. But uh, they may have made some raids. I, I'm not exactly sure on that. Uh, more about India, please. So much great stuff. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I, I, I will have more. Videos on India, no doubt about it. Yeah, it's one of my favorite places. All right. Scythian Bill, it puts the lotion on its skin or it gets the arrows again. Uh, I'm assuming that's a joke, but I'm not sure that I get it. <laughs> uh, did they use the skins of their own people or those of their enemies? Unknown, but I expect it was their enemies. Yeah. I don't think they're able to identify just from the skin uh, who it was, but... Um, they know they it was human. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at another one. All right. This is a, I got a couple of stories here on, on new geoglyphs that were found. Some people love geoglyphs. Okay. Feline and anthropomorphic 29 new geoglyphs discovered in Peru. Now, th now this has been um, enhanced. Okay. But it's showing you uh, it's a person. Yeah. Uh, in Ica, a region south of Lima on the coast of Peru, 29 geoglyphs were found by an archaeologist from the San Luis Gonzaga Na National University and a team of 20 students. Uh, so this is from the um, uh, period between 300 BC and AD 100. Okay, 
it's a Nazca, you know, we talked about the Nazca uh, period before, perhaps, uh, Paracas, late Paracas and early Nazca periods, Nazca, I guess it's Nazca, um, yes, uh, so you see these geoglyphs, now, of course, they are huge, right, some are bigger than others, okay, and you can find them up from the air, you can see them from the air, now, I know people have made much of these, uh, amateur researchers have, saying, especially ancient aliens uh, people, they say, oh, well, you can only see these from the sky. So they're either sending a message to someone up in the sky, or um, they could only appreciate them being in the sky. So it must mean that they had spaceships or something like that. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm not sure about every single geoglyph, but I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of them can be seen from uh, various perches and mountains and, and, and places around. You can actually appreciate and see them from the ground, not maybe right on the ground, but uh, at higher uh, elevations. Now, maybe there are some that you can't, I don't know, but if these are messages to the gods, then of course they would be directed towards the sky. Uh, but I think they probably would have been um, made uh, for people to appreciate as well. It's a subject I haven't made any videos about, but maybe it would be a good one to do in the future if you if you like this kind of thing. Yeah, so you can see some more of the, the glyphs here. A little bit about the Paracas culture from 800 BCE to 100 BCE. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> they use BCE here, and then up here, he uses BC and AD. That's interesting. <laughs> okay, <laughs> got to be consistent. Uh, you all know that I use uh, usually use CE and BCE, and you may be wondering about why I do. I've had some people get upset with me for saying BCE, um, and it's simply because, well, it's a scholarly convention, but also because um, studying ancient history, as you know I do, uh, it turns out that when they made the BCAD system, okay, uh, trying to determine when Jesus was born. They determined, basically 1 AD, it's the first year of our Lord. That would have been the year Jesus was born, but it was wrong. Uh, he, now we don't know exactly the date of Jesus' birth. There's a debate about this, but it probably wasn't 1 AD. So um, just for accuracy, accuracy's sake, I say CE or BCE, because then I don't have to say like, oh, Jesus was born, you know, two years before Christ. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Um, that's a short answer. If you want a fuller answer, uh, maybe I'll make a video on it. Uh, okay. Let's see. Um, I always use BC because regardless of the dating of our Lord's birth, he is the center point of history. Uh, okay. Okay. I mean, I have nothing against people using BC. Uh, always has to be spaceships, never anything simpler like from an air balloon or ancient airplane. Well, I don't know if they had ancient airplanes, but <laughs> but it's better than a spaceship. I mean, more maybe more, more realistic than a spaceship. Um, uh, okay, uh, Jesus didn't exist. Well, Mandy, I know some people say that, but I think there's enough evidence to suggest that he did. Um, I could do a whole video on that too. Uh, BCE CE is secular and therefore fine. Please ignore that it uses the same start point as BCAD. Uh, it's because the Gregorians designed out calendar, designed our calendar. Uh, I think it, yeah. Uh, is it from Gregorian times though? No, it's from, I think it's from a little bit after that. Um, you're right about that. Paul, uh, Paul Cooper must be one of the other commenters is all I'm guessing. Um, anyway, uh, okay. So anyway, lots of comments about Jesus and BC. All right. I opened up a can of worms here. Um, all right. Let's go on to another one. Here's another geoglyph. Oh, this is actually petroglyph. Sorry. There's a difference between a geoglyph and a petroglyph. As you know, geo is a glyph in the earth. Petro is a glyph in stone. So this is in Colorado. You might be surprised that Polish archaeologists are working in Colorado, but they are, and they found some 
petroglyphs dating back to the third century. Okay. Uh, not all of them, because you can see some newer graffiti over here, but some, okay, dating back to the third century. Uh, they've been exploring the area for over a decade. Okay. This is the Pueblo culture. All right. And they came over here from uh, Yagalonian University. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. And uh, they're being led by Radoslav Palonka. Uh, anyway, they're at the Castle Rock Pueblo Settlement Complex. Okay, this is at Mesa Verde Plateau. And uh, they found all kinds of cool petroglyphs mixed in with modern graffiti. It's kind of sad, but people, you know, want to add to this. Um, the discoveries of his team include previously unknown huge galleries and petroglyphs dated to various historical periods. The oldest of them, showing warriors and shamans, are estimated to date back to as early as the 3rd century AD, the period known as the Basket Maker Era. They were engaged in farming and produced characteristic baskets and mats. Most petroglyphs come from the 12th and 13th century. Okay, uh, Here you can see some more. So these are interesting. Now, of course, it'll take some study to try to figure out what's going on here, but uh, you can see some animals and so forth. Um, I don't know if you saw that TikTok video I made fun of where, <laughs> where there's a guy looking at a petroglyphs that looked like this, and he was claiming it was a portal <laughs> to another dimension. But I don't think that that's what it's supposed to represent. So here's some more. Anyway. So these are pretty cool. The Polish archaeologists uh, work closely with local Native American groups such as the Hopi and Ute tribes, helping them understand the iconography and art of the indigenous people. All right. Neat spiral. Yes. I hate when people deface things. Ah, yes, Elizabeth, me too. Uh, it's sad because... Um, uh, even when I go travel and do my travel videos, there are in many other countries, um, there's uh, not always great protection of the monuments and people just go in and doodle or scratch or whatever, you know. Uh, I want to always wonder if there are ancient culture versions of I was here before they had writing. Oh, before they had writing, maybe, maybe. But in ancient times, I know when they had writing in ancient times, they'll they say stuff like... We think it's a modern thing, like um, so-and-so was here, uh, but they did that in ancient times, too. Uh, I apologize for that being so reductionist. Couldn't think of a more expansive comment. Uh, oh, you mean neat spiral? It's okay. Uh, well, yeah, there's Norse runes all over saying that. I read somewhere that Jesus was born in August. The exact month of Jesus' birth is uh, disputed. There's a very cool channel called The Trek Planner who visits Pueblo culture sites he finds via Google Maps. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, good point, Psycat. Sometimes, um, you know, we look at these and we're like, oh, uh, it's, isn't it terrible how we have modern people uh, defacing the monument? But since there are... Uh, glyphs from several different periods of time, you could say that they all did that, right? Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at another one. Ooh, this is a cool one. Okay, ancient rituals on 2,000-year-old bamboo slips deciphered. Okay, uh, Tsinghua University has published the results of new research into five sets of bamboo slips in which the rites concerning high officials' meals and the ritual music system from over 2,000 years ago were carefully recorded. Uh, at a press conference on Sunday, this was um, this is dated uh, December 12th, uh, experts explained that those five sets dating back to the Warring States period and the Qin Dynasty, so we're uh, between 475 and 206 BC, are lost classics not found in extant literature. So this is, this is new. These are new writings, okay? And what do we find? We find a document called Rights of a High Official's Meal, Record of Rights of a High Official's Meal, Diagram of Five Tones, Music Style, and Fear Heaven and Use Body. These are the names that the bamboo slips have for these uh, uh, documents. Yeah. Uh, 
The most eye-catching are the first two ritual books compiled into one volume made up of 51 and 14 slips, respectively. Uh, the former records the ceremonial etiquette of the host and guests during a high official's meal, while the latter describes the specific etiquette of the officiant during the meal ceremony, complementing each other. So we learn about customs from ancient China from these new, just newly deciphered bamboo slips. Now, we, we found those slips earlier, but they've now been deciphered. And that's the cool part. So this is a historical discovery because it is looking at something that was already found and then getting information from it. Yeah. There are 2,500 bamboo slips, so there's more to be deciphered. Uh, it says here, as the research now enters the final stage, the whole collated report will be published in a total of 16 volumes with one volume a year. I'll be looking forward to that. Oh, and I think I have on this one, yeah, this is what bamboo slips look like. And uh, here are them, here are people working on them and examining them so you can see how, how big they are here. So it's pretty cool. Uh, any others? Yeah. See how they, uh, they're being preserved. I guess they're in some kind of liquid. Looks like they're in some kind of liquid. I'm not sure what they're being preserved in. Yeah. Okay. I always love it when we find writings. Yeah. Has anyone found Genghis Khan's or Genghis Khan's tomb yet? Not that I know of. A little bit out of my period, though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at another. Ancient DNA analysis reveals how the rise and fall of the Roman Empire shifted populations in the Balkans. Now, here's the interesting thing about this DNA analysis, the main takeaway here. They took a bunch of samples from the Balkans, from the Roman period, right? So this is uh, individuals who lived in the region between 1 and 1000 CE. They found no genetic evidence of Iron Age Italian ancestry. You know what that means? It means that the people who lived in the Balkans, even under Roman rule, okay, uh, do not have significant uh, a significant amount of Italian ancestry. That means the Romans didn't really go over there and settle the place and mix in with people and uh, have babies and all of that. They kind of kept fairly separate. Okay, that's kind of the the main takeaway here. Uh, the Balkans. Um, were didn't get a, a huge influx of uh, people from Italy during the Roman period. Yeah. From the 7th century CE onwards, coincident with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, large numbers of people emigrated from Eastern Europe, likely related to the arrival of Slavic-speaking populations, which resulted in present-day Balkan residents having 30 to 60 percent Slavic ancestry. Okay. So uh, they have Slavic genes. They came after the 7th century, but very little in the way of Roman uh, genes. So kind of interesting. DNA studies have really opened up a lot of uh, new um, branches of learning here because we wouldn't know this otherwise, right? Yeah. In the old days, they're looking at skulls, you know, and they're like, oh, does that look like a Italian skull? You, you, you can not, not always tell, right? So uh, now we've got DNA, so that's fantastic. No, our history was changed from 1538 catastrophe. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Um, Romanians are not genetically Roman. It, it's interesting because they're called Romanians, right, which comes from Rome, but uh, not much Roman there. But uh, let's be, we have to be uh, uh, careful about this. I'm glad you put Italian too, because what makes somebody a Roman? Do you have to be from the city of Rome? Do you have to be from Italy? What about just citizens of the Roman Empire? If you're just part of the Roman Empire, like if we went to the Balkans during the time that the Romans were ruling over the Balkans, and we said, are you Romans? A lot of them would say, yeah. You know, they're part of the Roman Empire. They accept Roman culture, but they're not genetically related to people from Italy, okay? So, yeah, 
But Italian maybe is a better word to use. Although now you're thinking, oh, mamma mia, let's have some spaghetti. It's not those kinds of Italians either, but meaning from Italy, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, most artifacts are fake from 18th century. Okay. Oh, you're one of those people. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, actually, we have tons of evidence for the existence of the Roman Empire. So it's, you can't really argue that it didn't exist. Okay. Um, all right. Do you, did you know that the channel told in stone? Great info on the Romans. Yeah, good channel. Good channel. Spaghetti and gabagools. <laughs> yes, that's very Italian American. Okay. Um, depends on the period. I can't remember which emperor made everyone in the empire a Roman. Before that, it was very controlled. Yeah, well, uh, Julius Caesar was the first to kind of expand Roman citizenship, but it still wasn't until everybody. Uh, I think it was like in the fourth century that Theodosius started giving them out more uh, liberally. But even after that, they they started uh, making everybody Roman. Yeah. People in Constantinople refer to themselves as being Roman, Roman even up to the time of the Ottoman invasion. That is true. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to another one here. Rare Western Han Dynasty tomb found in southwest China. Okay, this is from December 6th. So they found a tomb from the Western Han Dynasty. The Western Han is earlier than the Eastern Han. Okay, uh, it's from 202 BC to 25 AD. Okay, a well-preserved tomb near the city of Chongqing. Okay, uh, and what did they find? They found, well, here's an aerial view, but they found more than 600 precious cultural relics, such as lacquerware, woodware, bamboo ware, pottery and bronzeware, uh, were all in the tomb. Okay, um, and the tomb was pretty much undisturbed. It did have water in it, though. What is exciting about this discovery is not just the large number of unearthed artifacts, but also the list of burial items containing a precise year record, which has been verified as 193 BC, providing clarity on the tomb's burial time frame. An unearthed jade ware from the tomb shows the prominent position of the tomb owner. So they've been able to date when this tomb, when the person was put in the tomb, and as 193 BC, that's pretty cool. But check this out, huh? Really fantastic. Um, and you can see some beautiful objects from this tomb. Now you might say, well, what did we learn? Okay, we already know about the Han Dynasty. What, just another another tomb? Yeah, but in every tomb, there are uh, sometimes uh, not only artifacts like this, which teach us about art and the artifacts of the time, but also writings and so forth that give us further information. And we learn more about burial customs too. So I think it's an important find. And that's actually the second time we found the Han Dynasty tombs this year, because a few months back, we also did. We, I'm taking credit. <laughs> okay, let's look at another one. Oh, okay, this is a cool one. Now, this is about another ancient not ancient, another modern dating technique, okay? Uh, ancient bricks reveal enigmas in Earth's magnetic field, okay? This is a mud brick. Uh, mud bricks, of course, were used to make buildings in ancient Mesopotamia, and a lot of the mud bricks have little stamps on them here, okay? Um, the inscription says, Palace of Yakundiri, son of Sumatanim, king of the land of Hushitum. Uh, so anyway, they have labels on them. But these bricks, it says, hold magnetic clues that will help archaeologists demystify the era. There was a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and uh, they have found that the mud bricks have been marked by changes in the Earth's magnetic field. The discovery could help to date the era more accurately and provide a better insight into geomagnetic anomaly that occurred between about 3,000 and 2,500 years ago. We often de depend on dating methods such as radiocarbon dates to get a sense of chronology in ancient Mesopotamia. This is uh, Professor Mark Altawil saying this. However, some of the most common cultural remains, such as bricks and ceramics, cannot be easily dated because they don't contain organic material. This work now helps create an important dating baseline that allows others to benefit from absolute dating using archaeomagnetism. 
I get a lot of people. I've gotten a lot of people in my comments saying you can't date stone. You can't date bricks. Well, guess what? You can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there have been other ways of dating uh, stone uh, before. Uh, now bricks. Um, well, yeah, there there have been ways of dating bricks before, but this is a new one. Archaeomagnetic dating is going to be great. Okay, you don't need organic material in order to date the object. So they just measure, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but they measure how much the magnetic field of the earth has had an effect on the brick, and you can use that to figure out how old it is, right? They look at grains of iron oxide. Um, here's another one. The Earth's magnetic field leaves a signature in magnetic compounds, compounds like iron oxide. Because the magnetic field changes in strength, these signatures change over time, and the researchers were able to spot this with a mag, magnet, magneto, magnet, magnetometer. Uh, and then they can combine them with the records uh, of the kings. You know what king made the mud brick because he's got his name on it. You check out the Earth's magnetic field, and you can figure out when the king lived, when he reigned. Okay, so this is really great. We're going to be able to narrow things down a lot better. I don't know if a lot of you know this, but kind of my area of specific interest and speciality is in ancient chronology, like dating things, when things happened. And so I'm really excited about this one. Uh, assuming that dating stone is not the sole means of dating finding, stone is pretty old. Archaeomagnetism, wow, very cool. Presumably the magnetic particles are locked somehow by the brick baking process. Yeah, I, I would guess so. Uh, you can indeed date stones. Jerry Hall was with Mick Jagger for over 20 years. <laughs> Good one. Uh, okay, let's look at another one. Archaeologists unearth most shocking example of Roman slavery at Pompeii. They like to play it up. But yes, so at Pompeii, all kinds of things are still being found. Uh, they were working at a bakery here. Uh, the excavators were uh, examining the bakery. And the bakery, very small, but it had uh, iron bars on the windows. It's like, huh, I wonder why they'd have iron bars. Uh, on the bakery windows, <laughs> right? Well, they did some more investigation, okay? And they found also that, um, where is it here? Uh, uh, okay, there was a room. Wait, I thought there was something before this. There were a number of clues that indicated that slaves worked in this bakery, okay? Um, but now I'm having trouble finding it. And by the way, there were three people that died in the, in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Markings used to, oh yeah, this is what it was. Markings used to coordinate the movement of enslaved workers and blindfolded animals were found on the bakery's floor. The home was divided into a residential part adorned with lavish frescoes and the bakery where enslaved people were forced to grind the grain needed to produce bread. The bakery was cut off from the outside world, but the only exit leading to the main hall of the house. <laughs> so the only way that the slaves could get out of the bakery was by going through the master's house. Okay. It is, in other words, a space in which we have to imagine the presence of people of servile status whose freedom of movement the owner felt the need to restrict. Uh, it is the most shocking side of ancient slavery, the one devoid of both trusting relationships and promises of manumission. Yeah, in ancient Rome, okay, there are many different kinds of enslaved people, and um, many of them had complete freedom of movement, okay? Um, met, some of them were working towards freedom. They had an arrangement with their master and things like that, all right? It wasn't exactly like slavery like we know of, like, in, a, in the U.S., okay? Um, this is, uh, but this bakery is a little bit more <laughs> like that, where it's extremely restricted uh, they were worried even about the slaves running away, okay? Um, so, yeah. 
there was a room that had been lived in by enslaved people containing three wooden beds, a chamber pot, and a wooden chest. Um, oh, this is in a different uh, building, a uh, suburb of ancient Pompeii. Yeah. Anyway, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, it's not shocking to find evidence of slavery in a culture that used it. That's true, Richard. Uh, they were hyping it up a little bit. I'd rather work in a bakery where I could play with a donkey than slave in a mine. Well, there are different levels, aren't there, Elizabeth? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, bars on a window also prevent people from getting in and stealing. True, true. Uh, but there was it's everything together that kind of shows that the that the owner was trying to prevent people who were working in the room to get out uh, any other way except through his house. But yeah. Okay, let's look at another one. All right. Uh, Japan's possibly oldest molds for bronze relics found at Saga ruins. All right, so we're talking about molds, casting molds for bronze artifacts. Okay. And they've been saying, but they're not exactly... I guess they're not 100% sure that these are the oldest examples of uh, casting molds for bronze artifacts from Japan. One of the molds could date back to around 200 BC. I guess they're not exactly sure about the dating just yet. Okay. Um, the discoveries between September and October of the Yoshinogari ruins followed the finding in April of a stone coffin tomb believed to belong to a person of high status in an area of the site. Um and they didn't know whose burial it was, okay? Um, but it was announced in June that no human bones or burial accessories were found that could yield clues as to the individual's identity or the exact period of burial. I guess this is just an estimation of how old it is. Um, the molds, possibly used for casting swords and spears, were found within a range of about five meters northwest to about 10 meters south uh, southwest from where the stone coffin was discovered. So anyway, I think that's kind of interesting. All right, let's look at another one. Uh, this is another DNA study. They just keep coming out. All right, so indigenous Mexicans migrated to California 5,200 years ago, likely bringing their languages with them. Now, this is earlier than previously thought, okay? We're talking about hunter-gatherers from Mexico, okay? Uh, they migrated into California more than 5,000 years ago, potentially spreading distinctive languages from the south into the region nearly 1,000 years earlier than previously thought. Now, what languages are we talking about? We're talking about uto aztecan languages. It includes the uh, the language of Nahuatl, which is the Aztec and Toltec language, Hopi and Shoshone. All right. Now they used to think that uh, they migrated northward in a later time when, um, oh, what does it say here? Originally, this was published in Nature, by the way. Um, well, oh yeah. The timing of this migration refutes an existing idea that the spread of maize farming from about 4,300 years ago led to the spread of these languages, okay? Now we know it happened much, much earlier. They took the DNA from teeth and bones of 79 ancient people uh, found in Central and Southern California. And that's how they figured that out. Anyway, more information here on that. So DNA, again, shedding light on when things happened. They knew the way to San Jose. <laughs> uh, yes, Paul. Um, do you know the Hopi prophecy? No, I do not. It seems like everyone who believes they had a past life was some exciting noble or warrior, not just someone working a field doing the same thing every day. <laughs> That's true. And those are the most common people, right? Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at another one. I've got uh, six more to show you. Okay, Iron Age site in Europe unearths rituals of animal sacrifice. Okay, now this is from a Tartessian site 
I don't know if you heard of the Tartessian culture, once believed to be uh, mythical, uh, or at least legendary, and uh, now we've found it, okay? In fact, earlier this year, we found some stone busts from the same site. This is at Casas del Turunuelo, an Iron Age site, okay, in Spain. Uh, and they found a bunch of animal bones there, too, besides these stone busts. And uh, these are from sacrifices. Now, what's interesting about this is they weren't exactly sure if they had animal sacrifice in this culture, but now they know that they did, okay? And they know what animals they like to sacrifice. Uh, at least 41 of the animals sacrificed were horses or other equids, okay? Um, the other remains included six cows, four pigs, and one dog. Most of the horses were adult males aged up to 10 years old. Cows were the second most common animal. Yeah, sacrificed horses. Can you believe that? Yeah, the cow, the cows and the horses were ma males, but the pigs were females. But look at them all here. Uh, the full paper is published in uh, PLOS 1. You can find it here. So, learning more about Tartessos. Okay. 22 mummies wrapped in bundles, mainly children and newborns, found in Peru. So you can see some of the bundles here. And how old are they? They're quite old. Um, uh, third millennium BC. So that is um, the 2000s uh, BC uh, that they come from. Yeah. Now the complex dates to the 19th century, but they dug down. Oh, actually, at the top of the highest mound? No, I guess it would be higher up in this case. Interesting. I'm not sure what that means at the top of the highest mound, but that's where they found these burials. And 22 intact mummies were found. And you can see some uh, pictures here. Hope this doesn't gross you out. Partially mummified head of a woman. And you can see another one here. Yeah. All right. So that's pretty interesting. All right. Uh, let's see if you got any other comments here. Oh, kinetic energy. Good to see. Uh, horse sacrifice would for sure be expensive, and they weren't elderly horses nor foals. I know. Well, see, that's the whole point of sacrifice, uh, Elizabeth, because um, if you're not giving up something that you really value – then the sacrifice isn't worth much, right? It's, then it's not a real sacrifice. You're just giving away things that you don't want. It's not like giving to the goodwill, right? You uh, you have to give up one of your most valued horses. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's look at uh, the next one here. Okay. This is an, um, a mathematical analysis of carbon dates from... Tiwanaku. Many of you know I made a video about Tiwanaku uh, recently, and uh, it was about the date of Tiwanaku. When did it exist? And there are some amateur researchers who uh, want to claim that Tiwanaku comes from thousands and thousands of years earlier than uh, what the carbon dates say. Well, anyway, this uh, new Bayesian analysis of the carbon dates, which enables us to narrow down and get the dating more precise, you know how much I love that, has revealed some interesting things, okay? It tells us, and you can read the whole thing, but Tiwanaku was founded around AD 100, and around AD 600, it became the region's principal destination for migrants. So this is its peak in AD 600. Yes, it's much younger than what people would want it to be, okay? But that's when it existed. It grew into one of the Andes' first cities and became famous for its de decorated ceramics, carved monoliths, and large monuments. Our Bayesian models show that monument building ended eight, around AD 720. Around AD 910, burials and tombs ceased as violent deaths began, which we document for the first time in this paper. Ritualized murders are limited to the century leading up to AD 1020. So you can kind of see how they went into decline 
you know, uh, over the years. Our clearest proxy for social networks breaking down is a precise estimate for the end of permanent residence around AD 1010. So that is the general chronology of Tiwanaku. And yes, Pumapunku is at Tiwanaku. People get confused and they think Tiwanaku and Pumapunku are two different things. Pumapunku is in Tiwanaku. All right. And they say, well, look at the amazing stones and how precise they are. Oh, those people who live there between AD 100 and AD 600, they couldn't possibly have made these. You know, a lot of the alternative archaeology folks are basically um, skeptics about the abilities of ancient people. But these are pretty firm carbon dates. Uh, and many many carbon dates, 102, as you can see, 102 radiocarbon dates were taken to get these dates, all right? So they're pretty reliable. So I think that's an important study, and I wanted to share it with you. Don't you think Tiwanaku is probably built on older structures, settlements? Uh, well, yeah, but we we already know about those, okay? Um, and, but the, as you can see from the study, it was around AD 100 that things started to pick up there, right? So um, we don't have a, um, more advanced or superior work as the older parts. It starts out more primitive and it gradually becomes more advanced. And it was AD 600 or so when the great stuff was being made. So, yeah. Puma Poopku. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Poop jokes are always funny. All right. Hey, you got to make videos to debunk Bright Insight. Well, I did early on in the channel, so there are some early ones. I made about three. Um, and I will, uh, Captain Diabetes, I will be making an updated one uh, to deal with um, some of his newer evidence about the reshot structure being Atlantis. So uh, stay tuned for that. Okay. If you diss the abilities of ancient people, then that is basically plain racism. Yeah, you, well, you know what they say in reply? They say, well, the indigenous peoples say that a great uh, race of people came before them and built these things. Um, but they, they, they kind of get their facts wrong on this. Uh, it was Tiwanaku. It was the Inca who said that Tiwanaku came from a previous uh, civilization. Okay. Well, this is the civilization we're talking about, okay? This one, Tiwanaku culture, they're pre-Inca. So yeah, the Inca were right. It's these people who did it. And the descendants of these people still live in the area. All right, so yeah. Speaking of dating, have you gone over the new white sand dating? Um, no. Is this prehistoric? I'm not sure. Uh, but I, I, I'm not sure uh, about that one. Uh, maybe built on older stone working traditions. Well, the older stone working is not as uh, advanced as the later stone working. Yeah. Can the stones of Giza have been dated years back? Big project, and they are not that old. Uh, I have a video, maybe you know already, uh, Kinetic Energy, on the dating of uh, the Giza pyramids. Uh, different means, not carbon dating. Well, carbon dating the mortar, but then we have thermal luminescence dating and things like that also to help us to figure out when they were constructed. Okay. All right. The, the comments are coming fast. I can't keep up with them, but that's okay. Just keep writing. Um, I think the reshot structure could be, but it was definitely taken out by the great worldwide flood. And uh, well, well, watch my videos on, on Atlantis, or my, my updated one as it comes out. All right, let's 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 go over some of the other ones here. I have uh, three more to share with you. Ancient Yayoi period ruins discovered on Tokyo Kondo development site. So Yayoi, this is a, an early period in Japan's history. It dates to between the 9th century and BC and 3rd century AD, Okay. They found a settlement here when they were going to build a condo. Fortunately, in Japan, as in America, when they find archaeological remains where they're building something, they got to stop and they got to let the archaeologists come in. 
So that's what happened here. Okay. And they found 28 pit houses, uh, uh, including some dating back to the even more ancient Jomon period. So this is pre Yayoi. Okay. And here you can see, let me see if I can expand it. Uh, one of the pit houses, the bottoms of the pit house posts would have been here. Okay. Um, yeah. So they have found remains of these houses. Now, the sad thing is the archaeologists have to go in here and do all their work and then get out because they're going to destroy it. Yeah, they're not going to save this. They might save some small artifacts, I guess, but the pit houses themselves, I mean, this is land owned by somebody else. They want to build their condo, so they're going to destroy it. So the archaeologists have to take all the pictures that they can, get everything they can out of there because it's going to be gone. And that's the sad part. Okay. But uh, yeah, this is um, right in the center of Tokyo. They didn't even know it was there. So it's kind of cool. So good news and bad news with regard to that one. All right, second one here. Uh, archaeologists reveal 3,500-year-old graves in Mexico City's uh, Chapultepec Park. Chapultepec? Chapultepec? Chapultepec Park. Um, 3,500 years old. That's pretty darn old. Okay, We're talking about 2,500 BCE. So 10 tombs containing the remains of five people were found in the park. Um, yes, here you can see a wider shot. I can't uh, expand it. Archaeologists have discovered a series of 3,500-year-old graves on the edge of the park. Uh, the discovery occurred earlier this year during construction work. Yes, again, this is when we find things a lot of times is when construction is being done. The graves include 10 truncated conical tombs, half of them containing human remains, four women and one man, most of them young adults. They are believed to come from a large village that existed in the Lomas de Chapultepec area during the early and middle pre-classic periods between 2500 and 400 BC. Uh, so yeah, you can see some of the remains here. It's a minor discovery, but I think it's uh, of interest. It just happened. And then finally, a study came out. Now, this is a, a study of artifacts that have already been found, but new conclusions are being drawn from them by the research. And it's mainly about the history of saddles in East Asia and especially Mongolia. Okay. Uh, so this came out in, um, uh, I think this is Antiquity. Is this Antiquity Magazine? Uh, or is this Cambridge University Press? Yeah, Antiquity. I hear it. Antiquity Magazine. Yeah. So, um, uh, you can see all of it down here. So the, these are the areas that were studied. So I guess in China too. Um, but uh, it's all about saddles. And I thought it was interesting, not only because it teaches about the history of saddles and the kinds of saddles there are, but also because uh, they found out that um, a saddle down here, it's called a frame saddle right here, um, is uh, the oldest known frame saddle in the world, at least at this point, okay? Uh, that, so that's pretty cool. And they show you how they, they were put onto the horses. So if you like horses and you like, uh, you know, uh, learning about the, the history of uh, uh, riding horses and things like that, uh, this is an interesting study. All right. So basically, those are the uh, things I wanted to share with you this month. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, these discoveries. How do you explain the gate of Tiwanaku and the obelisk of Aksum have exact same symbolism? Uh, they do not have the exact same symbolism. They have different symbolism, uh, I would argue. Um, amazing, these endless arguments about saddle use and the invention of the stirrup. Oh, uh, yes. The astonishing thing is how similar it is in design to, for instance, any normal Western saddle. Well, yeah, I, I guess because there's a, if you want to get on top of a horse... There's only so many ways that you can make a saddle, right? I, I guess, but yeah, there are. Uh, there may even have been some influence from outside. Who knows? But yeah. Um. Uh, so uh, before I go, I just want to remind you again that we appreciate any donations that you have. I had the little ticker going along the screen. I don't know if any of you. Did any of you? Get a Usually, I get a little something. Let's see. Uh. Uh. 
Uh, I can't see now. No super chats. Okay. Well, no super chats today. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, could appreciate anything that you have to help the channel out. It's an audience supported channel. The only way I can keep making videos, and this is my full time job, okay, is from your support. I don't get paid by uh, the Smithsonian or the government <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, it's only you guys. So I appreciate any help that you can uh, give me. And uh, I just want to remind you again, for those of you who came in later, uh, I do have two courses that I am now offering. Courses are going to be offered by World of Antiquity, by yours truly. And I have a link below the video in the description box to the courses. They are uh, The first course is going to be Ancient Explorers, about exploration in the ancient world. Uh, and this is um, starting in January, January 7th. And then I, I, my next class is The Dawn of Civilization, which is all about how civilization got started uh, in Mesopotamia uh, and the Near East. Um, so that's going to be kind of cool too. So if you want to take a class with me, uh, you can do that. And if you are a patron, you can get a discount uh, on the price of the class. So uh, anyway, thank you for watching today, everybody. I'm glad you can join me. I hope you like these uh, latest archaeological discoveries. And tomorrow, I'm going to release a video on the greatest discoveries of the whole year. So stay tuned for that. Uh, thank you, Jez. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it very much. All right. Catch you later.